multiply the translations into the Lorentz group, what you have of the what you have is the Poincaré group. Okay, so under a Lorentz transformation, we showed, I think last time, that if you have a scale of field in phi of x, the inverse of L is, and uh, is in fact phi of Lx. So this is how a scalar field transforms. Let me just mention what the uh, scalar field is, just to remind you. Um, in the PNS notation, it's an integral dqp over 2 pi cubed, um, 1 over the square root of 2, p0 or e sub p, a sub p, e to the minus i px plus a dagger sub p, e to the i px. So that's um, what that looks like. And this px here is p0 t minus t dot x in the pns. Okay, so um, I'm uh, going to talk now about um, Lie algebra, the rotation group first, and then the Lorentz group, and then representations of the Lorentz group. And um, I think that's uh, something that will provide some background for you so that um, reading P and S will be a little bit easier. Um, I'm drawing this from my notes, and let me get my, my this, these notes that are, um, you can reach this, these notes from, from the class web page. So let's, let's go first to the rotation group. The idea is R of X dot R of Y, is there a question? <coughs> Um, which is X transpose, R transpose, in matrix notation, R, Y, these are three by three matrices, X and Y are three vectors. So this is the, R is in the rotation group, if this is true, and that tells you then that, oh, I'm sorry, the rest of this was that um, this is supposed to be X dot Y, and uh, which is a equivalently X transpose the identity matrix Y and so you have then that R transpose R is equal to the identity. That tells you that the determinant of R squared is one, so the determinant of R is plus or minus one. The um, subgroup with determinant R equal to one is called SF3. The whole group is called O3. S generally stands for unimodular or unit determinant. Now, to get the Lie algebra, what we do is we take this equation and apply it to the case of a small a matrix that's close to the identity. So omega is infinitesimal, I is the three by three identity matrix. And then this equation, R transpose R equals I, is I plus omega transpose I plus omega equals I. And so this, if you multiply that out, you get I plus omega transpose plus omega plus omega transpose omega equals I. This is a physics class, something that's small, squared, Ignore this cancels, and you get simply that omega transpose minus omega. And so that tells you then that that's what the generators of the rotation group look like. And um, so you can 
write these matrices as Y1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0. Y2 is 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0. The zeros here. Y3 is 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. And then zeros there. Effectively, then, Yb, the matrix AC, is epsilon ABC, where this is the Levy Trivita anti-symmetric tensor or symbol. And epsilon 1, 2, 3 is defined to be the 1. And whenever you take the 1, the 2, or the 3 and you shift them, you can do any transposition, you get a minus sign. You can do transpositions, you get two minus signs, and back to the plus sign. And since it's totally anti-symmetric, epsilon, for example, 1, 1, 3 is also equal to minus epsilon 1, 1, 3, and so it has to be 0. So any epsilon with a repeated index vanishes. These matrices are real and anti-symmetric, so they're anti-Hermitian. Y dag is minus Y. And so what we do in physics classes is we write XB as IYB, and then the commutation relations are XA, XB equals I, epsilon ABC, XC. In other words, you can see if you define XB as a 3 by 3 matrix IYB, then Y is defined this way, so if they're anti-symmetric and linearly independent, then you get automatically these commutation relations, which are the commutation relations of the Lorentz group. They're also the commutation relations of angular momentum, JA, JB, and I, epsilon ABC, JC. So that's the commutation relation generally of angular momentum. The reason is that angular momentum are the operators that generate rotations. As usual, I have chocolate. Anybody has a question? Yeah, I didn't quite catch the connection between finding the generators and the next part. Sorry. Thanks. I'm sorry, say that again. You found this W transpose equals negative W? Omega, omega. Omega, sorry. I don't see the connection. Why you did that, I guess I don't understand. How I got that? I understand how you got it. I don't understand why you got it. Oh, well, because this tells, this characterizes then the generators. They have to be anti-symmetric matrices. They're three by three. There are only three linearly independent anti, three by three anti-symmetric matrices. So it gives you the matrices? Yes. I mean, you could have chosen a different set. And, you know, you could have put some extra anti-symmetry here. But that would have meant that, in other words, you don't need to add that there because you've got it here. It's like a basic set. Right. It's a minimal linearly independent set. All right. You said these are the same commutation relations for the Lorentz group? Angular momentum. No, 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 no. Rotation. Just the rotation. This is the rotation group. I just think the identity is. But. But, since you mentioned it, we'll now go to the Lorentz group. Why are we sticking an I in front of it, though? It's because we're in the physics department, and we'll lose our license if we don't have a secret information. Okay. It's a little stupid, actually. I think we've carried this sticking I to make things permission, and then we have to put a minus I in front of it. 
so we get back to what it really is. So there's a certain amount of um, This is eta 
plus omega transpose eta plus eta omega plus omega transpose omega equals eta. This, in other words, I'm using this formula here. This is the criterion, L transpose eta L equals eta. Okay, so we've got this equals that. The etas cancel. This we ignore. So we have the rule omega transpose eta plus eta omega equals zero. So it's not quite as simple as for the rotation group where we just had that omega was anti-symmetric. Instead, it's got this screwy kind of behavior under transposition, namely that omega transpose is minus eta omega eta. So it's a little more complicated. And notice once again that it doesn't matter whether you use the Weinberg metric or the Peston metric because they only differ by an overall minus sign, so this criterion is the same. All right, so what does it tell us about omega? Well, this tells us that the time time and the space space elements change sign. That's what this tells you. Under transposition. And the time space don't change sign. Okay, so that means that you can write omega in terms of a small three vector theta and another small three vector lambda in terms of matrices that look like this. R1, otherwise zero. So these R's are just the Y's with an extra row. They're just the Y's with zeros added. Well, zero, minus one, zero, 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 one, zero. Everything else is zero. So R3 is, maybe I'll write this one. These are in the notes here. However, I must warn you that these notes, I wrote these notes in the Weinberg metric. All right, the changes are. Okay, so this is R3. You see, this is just Y3 sitting there and then zeros. So those are the three R's. In other words, the space space, the space space part is anti-symmetric. All right, now for the time space part, which is to say the time is the first column and the first row, that's time. And so here we have the first boost matrix then is zero, one, one, zero. And maybe I'll write this out explicitly since. B2, these are actually simpler than the rotation matrix. They should be symmetric. Yes, they're symmetric. Okay, B2. And B3, just not to take all day, there's a one there, there's a one there, and everything else. Okay, so these are the generators of the Lorentz group, these six matrices 
Three of them are the ones you already saw in the rotation group. And the other three are just three matrices that uh, satisfy this relation. And um, you can check that uh, these Bs um, do that. The Bs do that, or the total ones get that together? Well, um, it's sufficient for each of the Bs to do that, in other words, and each of the Rs to do that. Okay, right, right. In other words, what you want in particular here is B2, say, transpose minus eta B2 eta. Okay, so we can write an arbitrary Lorentz transformation that's near the identity as um, theta dot r plus lambda dot b. And once again, we have to uh, deal with the uh, Well, we have this prejudice of sticking eyes in front of everything. So in the case of the R's, we're just going to do the same thing as we did before. Namely, uh, we're going to say that this is equal to minus I, theta sub L, I'm summing over L, I R L. So minus I times I is 1. And then we're going to do the same thing here. Minus I lambda J. Uh, I, B, J. Okay, so we haven't changed anything. <coughs> but now, we're going to say, well, this is minus I, theta L, J, L. So we're going to say that J, L is I, R, L. And then we're going to say this is minus I, lambda J, K, J, <coughs> where K, J is um, I uh, BJ. Okay, so we haven't changed anything. Now, these R's are real and anti-symmetric, so you multiply by I and you get imaginary and anti-symmetric, so these guys are Hermitian. The B's were already Hermitian because they're real and symmetric. When we multiply by I, these now are anti hermitian uh, I just had one question before you proceed. Uh, what is the number of uh, these generators? What, what, what? How did we arrive at there being only six generators? And what is the number of these Well, they're, they're matrices that are four by four and that satisfy this condition. And um, how do you know the stock one to look? And how do you know there's not a hundred of them that satisfy the condition? How, how do you know there aren't others? Yeah. There couldn't be a hundred. Well, certainly aren't a hundred, <laughs> right. Um, well, I mean, all right, let's, let, 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 let's just think about this for a second. Um, these are, these ones, We've got L equals the identity plus something. Um, the time, time, and space, time change sign under transposition. So you can't have anything under the diagonal. Right? So um, you start out, say, with 16 possible matrices, and you lose four. So you're down to 12. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! So if you um, view them as but like but but if you want if you want the thing, huh? No, I mean I was just thinking. But yeah, it, the point is if you if 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 they're satisfying this rule, they're either they're basically symmetric or anti-symmetric under transposition. Okay. So that means that instead of having, oh, let's put it this way. Suppose they were all anti-symmetric 
under transposition. Then you start out by saying, well, they're, they're just the anti-symmetric real matrices. There are only six of those because you've only, once you, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six places above the diagonal. And once you, and, and you can put a one here, zeros everywhere else, but then they have to be, say, symmetric or anti-symmetric. So that's, yeah, this, that, this is the general rule then, all right? Can't be on the diagonal because of the, the rule that they change sign if they're time, time, or space, space, which the diagonal shows you. Next, um, then whatever you have here, you put a one somewhere, it determines, or a zero, it determines what's over here because the thing is either symmetric or anti-symmetric, so depending on where you are. Yeah. And you only have six choices, so there can only be six. You can multiply the rotation, the R matrices together twice to get a symmetric matrix, so that would give you all six symmetric matrices that you could have. Is that a way to look at it? You want to multiply two R's together. Well, the same one together. If you square it, and the oh, symmetric matrix. Oh, square it? Yeah. Oh, but that would be, I think, diagonal. Mm -hmm. Out of, uh, yeah, there is. Right? Yeah. Isn't that diagonal? Yeah, you don't yeah. want any diagonal. Yeah. All right, look, look, look. This is the way it is. I mean, I think, in a sense, I've, 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 I've given the argument here why there are only six. Um, right? Okay. Now, notice that over there, when we had SO3, we had a group that was compact. And in what sense is it compact? Well, you can label all elements of the group, and you can identify them with the points in the sphere of a certain radius, with actually the opposite, the points that the opposite sides of the sphere identified, actually. Okay. Um, and that's a compact set. It's certainly bounded, and you can think of it as, since it is, uh, it's actually closed because it's, it's all radii less than or equal to pi. In three, in all three vectors less than or equal to pi. So that's, that's the parameter space of SO3, so it's a compact group. For the Lorentz group, the boosts go, get arbitrarily big, so it's not compact. It's a general theorem in uh, group theory that you can have finite dimensional unitary representations for a compact group, like SO3. But for a non-compact group, like the Lorentz group, or the even translations, the unitary representations um, are infinite dimensional. They can't be finite dimensional. And here we're looking for a four by four or a finite dimensional representation more generally, but here it's just four by four, and so we can't have a unitary representation of um, the Lorentz group. That's why three of the six generators are anti-dimensional. All right, and it's because the Lorentz group is not compact. Now, what if you can just multiply these matrices together and form the commutators, and what you find is that they satisfy these relations, J, I, G, or J. Well, it's clearly I, F1, I, J, K, J, K. We're summing over K from one to three. Let's see, did you, you didn't get a chocolate from your last question. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, actually, who's missing a chocolate? Not throw out chocolates. I don't know if I phrased it. Who's okay? All right. Can I have a chocolate? Yes. You've got to ask me. All right. So, what do you do? So, when you write U of L over there, when you're doing this transformation on phi? Right. This is an inventory, but it's a dimensional. This is a chocolate. I got one. Oh, 
three vectors of operators, which they are. So this is a uh, Lorentz transformation that's near the identity. Um, if you multiply all these guys together, what you get is a subgroup of S031 called the proper orthochronous. I mentioned this to you before. It doesn't change the sign of time if the vector is time-like. The rest of the Lorentz group can be can be gotten from the pro and this is called proper orthochronous. Proper just be the determinant being one. Um, you get the rest of the Lorentz group by taking uh, space reflections, time reflections, and space-time reflections on these matrices. And that gives you the whole Lorentz group. All right, let's go back now to this proper orthochronous Lorentz group and the matrices near the identity. And then what we have is L equals I plus omega equal to I plus theta dot R plus lambda dot B. What is this equal to? Let me write it out for you explicitly. It's 1, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. Lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. 1, 1, 1. Minus theta 3, theta 2, minus theta 1, theta 1, minus theta 2, theta 3. So this is what it looks like. This is what an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation looks like. And uh, what does it do to any vector? Well, it takes Lx to x prime. And uh, this is x prime 0 is equal to x0 plus, in fact, let me write it simply, lambda dot x. So this is the time component. And um, x prime 1. Well, you can multiply this out. Let me show you a neat way of writing it. This way is going to be tedious. You can just take the 4 by 4 matrix, multiply it by the vector x0, x1, x2, x3. By writing all the indices upper, we don't have any minus signs to worry about. No matter whose matrix we use. I hope those are analogies. Um, I have a dog uh, who sneezed a couple of days ago. It was really fun to see him sneeze. Because, see, as usual, dogs are lying on the floor. And so, you know, when you sneeze, your head goes down. She had to be, and of course, she had a dog, she a long snout. So she had to be careful. And she sneezed not to slam her face into the floor. So what she do is she throw her head back, shoot, and she did it three times. <laughs> Managed not to hurt her. <laughs> anyway. So this is the easy way of writing it. And I think it's interesting to look at this. And I'm using wedge here is the same thing as x, meaning cross product. I didn't want to have two x's next to each other, OK? So that's what this, that's what this thing is if you write x prime equals this 4 by 4 matrix times this 4 vector x. What you get are these two equations. The time looks like that. Time prime is time plus lambda dot x. Space prime is space. And this part is just the standard rotation, theta cross x. But this is the crazy thing that happens under relativity. It's time times the boost. It's, it's, um, it's, it's cute. I like, I like this pair of writing things. Um, OK, notice uh, that th this, of course, is just saying that x prime is Lx. Because that tells you that L inverse x prime is equal to x. And so 
if, F, if L takes you from X to X prime, L inverse takes you from X prime back to X. And um, what that means then in particular is that XB is L inverse BA X prime A. Here I'm using upper indices and the convention here is that uh, if this thing that I wrote there, this is L upper A lower B. Okay, that's what this is. All right. Anyway. So this uh, tells us what DA prime is. Let's see what DA prime is. This is partial with respect to X prime A. And that, of course, is partial with respect to XB, partial of XB with respect to X prime A, summed over B from 0 to 3. But partial of XB with respect to X prime A is L inverse BA, partial B. So this is partial prime A is partial B times L inverse BA. And of course, L inverse, we have that two relation with thing with eta L eta. Okay, this tells us in particular that the divergence of the full vector doesn't change because this is then dB L inverse BA and this is LAC BC and now this is just matrix multiplication of L inverse L. That's the identity and so this is just just that. So the, the divergence is unchanged. Um, although, of course, you take x x prime. Okay. Now, if instead we talk about arbitrary theta, then we have e to the minus i theta dot j minus i lambda dot b. So this is an arbitrary 4 by 4 uh, member of the Lorentz group. And um, um, in fact, it's not, uh, this is an arbitrary member of of uh, SO31, um, what do I call it? Uh, let me just call, put a plus there, the plus meaning that it doesn't change the sign of time. All right. So, so far we just have one representation of the Lorentz group, these four by four matrices, which are the matrices that you start out with when you're dealing with the Lorentz group. Um, there's one remarkable simplification Namely, we can define J plus minus sub L as one half JL plus or minus I KL. So now these matrices are not Hermitian, but they have remarkable properties. J plus I, J plus J, I, epsilon I, J, K, J plus K. J I minus J J minus I epsilon I J K J minus K and J I plus J J minus zero commutator. So in other words, you take the six generators of the Lorentz group and you form these funny ladder operator like combinations and what you get is two SU2s. You get two SU2s with non-permission generators. And so the Lie algebra of SO31 is two copies of the Lie algebra of SU2 or SO3. So that 
means, since we know already all the representations of SU2, you learned that in quantum mechanics, they're matrices dj of, I'll put j in parentheses, they're square 2j plus 1 by 2j plus 1 square matrices. Um, for SU2, they're actually unitary, but here, because the generators are in Hermitian, um, they're not uh, unitary. But they're 2j plus 1 by 2j plus 1 matrices. And what do you mean that um, aren't the elements of SU2 going to be unitary? What do you mean that because they're entire? The Lie algebras are the same. The Lie algebras of SO3 1 is two copies of the Lie algebra of SU2, like that. Um, but now the the matrices then dj are made out of these generators j plus, by exponentiating these j plus and j minus, which then give you non-unitary matrices. Okay. That's what it is. So I mean, if they were unitary, then this would be a finite dimensional representation. Right, it would be a finite point. dimensional unitary representation. And okay. Mathematics would break down, physics would stop, and everybody would freeze in some state of uh, catatonia. Fortunately, things aren't that bad, even after eight years of W. All right, so the representations of Lorentz proof then look like this, dj, j prime which are basically two of these dj's. So they're sort of e to the um, minus i theta dot j one, well, j plus uh, well, minus, it'll actually be z. All right, let me, let me go on. I, I, I don't want, I, I shouldn't add lib. Some of this is a little bit tricky. Okay, so this is dJj prime, and they're obtained by exponentiating these operators. Right, so let's see how this goes. First of all, j, which is j plus plus j minus, these are the angular momentum operators, and you can see that if you take j plus plus j minus, you get something that's just the ordinary j, and that's unitary. That's our mission. And so these matrices dj j prime uh, for the for the part these represent the rotation part of the Lorentz group by unitary matrices. So this part is unitary. And in fact, then. Um, and, and, and what kind of J is it? Well, it's J plus plus J minus, and so it's, it, you imagine that there are spins that go from J plus J prime to J plus J prime minus one down to J minus J prime absolute value. So this is the, in as much as this is the way the angular momentum goes, if the sum of those two angular momentums uh, uh, the, the, this representation can represent particles of spin have to value j minus j, j minus j prime all the way up to j plus j prime. For example, d0, 0, zero represents spin 0. d1 half 0 represents spin 1 half. But also, d0 1 half represents spin 1 half. d1 half 1 half, well, what would this be? This would be spin 0 for 1 half minus 1 half up to 1 half plus 1 half. So this is spin 0 and spin 1. Okay, so you have a spinless particle and a vector particle. But 
the, these two then would transform as this, the spinless particle is the time component of a four vector, and the spin one part is the vector part of the four vector. So this would represent a uh, vector field, say a mu, or if you want, if we use Latin letters, a sub a, where a goes from zero to three. So this, is, this represents a vector field, or a spin one and a particle, spin one and spin zero. All right. The generators Kj, though, are minus Ij plus, plus Ij minus. So remember where we started here. We took the angular momentum operators and the boost operators and made these funny operators which have these nice algebraic properties. To get back to the physical operators, well, the boost is minus Ij plus, plus Ij minus. All right, so now to get to the two-dimensional representations. By the way, I've got the chocolate. Is there somebody missing the chocolate? The board somebody raised a question. I forgot to toss the chocolate. I'll be more gentle tossing it this time. I don't want to hear that person again. All right, let's go to the case D one half zero. Okay, so this is J equals a half. J prime equals zero. So we know what J is for uh, spin one half. J is going to be then simply sigma over two, and K is going to be minus i sigma over two. That's that, that's how we're going to do it. In other words, we're going to say that this is J plus, and this is minus i j plus, because we're representing j plus as sigma over 2, j minus is 0, and so k is just minus i j plus, which is minus i sigma over 2, and j is just sigma j plus, which is sigma over 2, j minus is just represented by 0. So that means that the 2 by 2 Lorentz matrix is e to the minus i theta dot sigma over 2 minus lambda dot sigma over 2. It's, it, it's, it's minus i times minus i just gives you a minus sigma over 2. Is that a j plus of k? Yes. Thank you. No, I don't Really? Yeah. The people sitting next to you are very happy. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't want to know. <laughs> All right, so this is the non unitary two by two representation of the Lorentz group for the case j equals a half, j prime equals zero. There are two by two matrices like this. This part of it is just a, ro a unitary rotation matrix. But then it gets multiplied by e to the minus lambda dot sigma over 2. And this is a permission. And this is real. Um, I find it useful to write this as minus z dot sigma over 2, where z is a complex 3 vector, and lambda is the real part of z, and um, theta is the imaginary part of z. So um, that's the, um, and, and I don't think I should use L anymore. L is the 4 by 4 case. This is the D 1 half 0 of theta lambda. This is what this thing is. Rotation theta, right hand is about the axis theta, and then a boost by lambda. It's non-unitary. It has unit determinant. And it's a member of the group SL2C, and this is sort of obvious. S means determinant 1. L means linear. Well, any matrix is a linear transformation. 2 means 2 by 2. C means complex entries. So this is a matrix 
that has um, it's a two by two matrix with complex entities. Okay, now under this one half zero, there's a, a nice four vector, and the, the four vector is minus the identity times sigma, but not times sigma, and sigma. This is a four vector under D one half zero, and what's meant there is D adjoint one half zero theta lambda minus I D one half zero theta lambda equals minus I plus lambda dot sigma and the same thing here D dagger let me just write it this way D dagger sigma D is sigma plus minus I lambda plus theta cross sigma Okay, this is the same thing as we had over here. Because these are the rules for how a four vector transforms if we have rotation, theta, boost, lambda, infinitesimal transformation. And again, this is for small, this is for theta, much less than one, lambda. Okay, so they transform as a uh, four vector. Now, remember how the scalar field transforms under Lorentz transformation. It's u of lambda, y of x, the inverse of lambda, u of l, phi of x, the inverse of l is phi of lx. For a spin one half field, the simple spin one half field, you have u of l psi of x. This is a two component field. U inverse of l, and it's equal to d one half zero of l inverse c of Lx. So that's how the thing transforms. And in particular, in this case, if it's u of theta and lambda, c of x, u inverse c and lambda is, well, it's, let me just write it as e to the minus z dot sigma. Lx, where L is the uh, transformation there. And in fact, if we wanted to write out what that would be, it would be e to the minus z dot sigma over 2, and that's a 3 vector, c of, and now Lx is t plus lambda dot x, x plus t lambda plus theta wedge x. So this is this is the time component, this is the space component. And again, this is for any infinitesimal case. For the non-infinitesimal case, this part is correct. That is to say, this is the expression for, for a, an arbitrary, well, special orthochronous at least, uh, Lorentz transformation. Uh, but um, if we want, uh, for the infinitesimal case, we can write Lx explicitly and simply, and it's just that. Okay. 
A thing that transforms like this is called a left-handed vial spinner. And um, you mean something that tr transforms like this? What, what do you mean a thing that transforms like this? Wait a second. Okay, wait. Said, okay. Said, a okay. field that transforms this way under Lorentz transformations is called a left-handed vial spinner, just as a field that transforms that way under Lorentz transformations is called a spin zero field. Okay. Now, for a spin zero field, remember, you can have a neutral spin zero field, in which case you just have A and A dagger. In other words, this is a neutral spin zero field. And remember the Rasmus has I went through, you have two spin uh, zero fields of the same mass, then you can take a take complex linear combinations, you can take phi one plus i phi two, and this makes sense as long as the P zero for a given three momentum, the P zero is the same, which is say the mass is the same. Okay, because then the P zero up here and the P zero there is the same in both cases. And then um, what you wind up with is you wind up with a field that's a complex spin zero field that represents a particle and its antiparticle. Where the particle is A1 plus I A2. And then um, when you take A1 plus I A2, you get A bar dagger, which is A1 dagger plus I A2 dagger. And you see this one isn't the adjoint of that because they have an I here. And so this is the adjoint of A which is A1 minus I, A2. And the creation operator here is A dagger, which is A1 dagger minus I, A2. All right, similarly, this guy can represent a neutral particle, a single neutral spin one half particle. Or if you have two single neutral spin one half particles of the same mass, you can take C1 plus I, C2, and then you get a complex spin one half left-handed vial spinner. Where, where does the term left-handed come from? Uh, uh, um, then I, it comes from the fact that in the massless case, the particles create the creation operators on the vacuum. Mm -hmm. A dagger of sub P, say, on the vacuum is going to create a particle of spin of the momentum P, say, but the helicity is going to be, let me try to get this right. Um, if it's right-handed, then it's spinning like this, and so the angular momentum. So the the, holistic, the, the angular momentum of the particle is, is of the spin of the particle is opposite to the direction of motion. So it's polarized backwards. Uh, so so to speak, sigma dot p is sigma dot p hat is minus one in a certain sense, or negative helicity. And in fact, neutrinos, uh, the ones that are produced, at least in ordinary weak interactions, mm -hmm. copious with the well. Weak in weak interactions, nothing's copious. Uh, but um, those are of negative felicity, and this is the sort of field that, that, that describes them. Um, Now, what is the action density for this field? Remember, the action density for the spin one half field is um, 
L is if it's a, a single neutral field, then it is um, the time derivative squared uh, minus the space derivative squared. This is the action density for spin zero field. For the case of a spin one half field, the action density L to left hand okay. It's I C dagger of X D zero the two by two identity matrix minus Brad dot sigma C of X. And one can show that if this is the way the field transforms, then this is Lorentz covariant in the sense that U of L L of X, so this is actually L of X, the inverse of L is L of L of X. So the action density is Lorentz covariant. Now, if all we've got is one left-handed field like this, then the mass term that we can add, the mass term in this case is minus a half m squared phi squared. Here, the mass term is what's called a Majorana mass, so alpha left-handed, and it's minus m c transpose of x sigma 2 c of x and then minus the Hermitian conjugate which is minus m and then just let me write it this way. Alright, so why is it that this is invariant? Showing that this is invariant is a little more tricky, but this we can see it's invariant pretty easily. Under the Lorentz, or covariant, not invariant. So under the Lorentz transformation, this C goes to e to the minus C dot sigma over 2 C. Okay? Then we have a sigma 2. And then we have e to the minus Z dot sigma over 2 C. Then the whole thing transposed. Okay? So sigma 2 isn't going to pick anything up because it gets the sigma top in the transformation. I'm just taking this term and I'm... No, no, sigma 2. The field transforms under the Lorentz transformation. Under you, a good question. No, no, I mean. Under the Lorentz transformation, it's uh, the field that transforms. Not ordinary numbers. Numbers are invariant and matrices are just arrays of numbers. So what happens here? This is equal to C transpose E to the minus Z dot sigma transpose over 2, sigma 2, E to the minus Z dot sigma over 2, C. Okay, can you all see that? I know you can. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sigma transpose. Sigma 1, why don't you just sit right here? Uh, get right there. Sigma 1 transpose, oh, there's only one thing you need to memorize in physics. Sigma 1 is this, sigma 2 is that, and sigma 3 is that. Everything else you can learn on the screen. Um, so, Sigma 1 and sigma 3 don't change sign when you transpose, but sigma 2 does. On the other hand, sigma 1 and sigma 3 anti-commute with sigma 2. And so when you pull this thing through, you get a minus sign on sigma 1 and sigma 3 because they anti-commute with sigma 2. You get a minus sign on sigma 2 because it's anti-symmetric. And so this whole thing is C transpose e to the z dot sigma over 2, the sigma 2 here, 
either the minus z dot sigma over 2c, and that's just equal to c transpose sigma 2c. These guys just cancel. Let me give you the identity. This thing is called a Majorana mass term. Notice that if this field would have annihilation operators, so would this. And so this Majorana mass term would annihilate two particles. It would also have the creation operators, so it would have four different terms. But if you just look at the annihilation terms, it annihilates two particles. So it doesn't conserve charge if the field is charged. Not conserving charge is a big experimental no-no, and so this Majorana mass term works only for neutral particles, or more generally for particles that don't have any of the sort of charges. Anyway, charge for particles more generally. Okay, so that's enough for now. We've run out of time. We'll finish up. Well, I don't know if we'll finish the Lawrence stuff, but we'll probably finish it on Monday. Any questions? All right, so turn in the homework electronically to Mr. John. Or paper-wise to his mailbox, and we'll say sometime tomorrow.